Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, they're going to close the door shortly. I just got the nod as soon as it turned 250 to start. So why don't we get right into it? My name's Matt Lodato, um, Product Management Director at Teradata, and I own Kylo. I also own Presto, so you can talk to me about that too if you if you want. Um, and you know, today, you know, the marketing team picked a clever title: you know, supercharging your NiFi environment with uh, with Kylo. And we're going to get into all of that. I want to spend a few minutes starting with, you know, my favorite question as a product manager, which is why? You know, why did we build Kylo? Why did we think it's a good piece of software? Why, in fact, do I think it is a great piece of software? And if I'm going to make the assertion that Kylo is a great piece of software, there's a reason for that. There's a reason, the reason being that I understand and you understand what the word software means. And so we have to agree on what the word great means. And I take a big picture approach. I take it when I, I build software and I take it when I think about, you know, pretty much everything. You know, we used to live in trees and then we lived on the ground and then there were tents and then there were huts and then there were buildings and groups of buildings and towns and cities and skyscrapers, right? And all of those things represent sort of advances in how people house themselves, how people take care of the basic need of, of shelter. And I used to carry things in my hand and then a sling and then I rolled it along the ground and I dragged it and I invented the wheel and I put a horse in front of the wheel after I invented the axle and put it on the cart and I put a locomotive in place of the horse and I built rockets and I sent them into space. And all of these things are doing a couple of things, right? When you look at those histories, you're looking at what happens when you take something that used to be hard and complex and hide that complexity. And in each of those stages, some sort of innovation came along and gave you the ability to hide that complexity, push it down, push it out of the way, and turn it into something that was, was easier for somebody to solve their problem of, you know, how do I carry things or how do I, you know, not get struck by lightning or get wet when when it rains out. And I think the same thing applies to software. And so if there's any rules that, that I live by, if you want to call them sort of, you know, Lodato's three laws of software, and I don't claim that these are, are, are unique, you know, my, my assertion is that it absolutely needs to hide complexity. So if you have great software and it's still exposing complexity that you haven't sort of figured out how to hide uh, from your user, then you're not doing your job well enough. And if it doesn't make easy things easy, then you also aren't doing your job very well. And finally, uh, it needs to make hard things possible. And again, the non-software examples I gave are important in the sense that everybody can wrap their heads around them and recognize that in each of those transitions from hut to house to, to city or from, from, from carry to drag to roll to, to use a locomotive or a rocket motor, um, somebody thought about the problem of you know, sort of moving from point A to B in the motion example. What complexity can we push down? The things in the prior stage that were hard but possible now became the easy things. And the easy things were completely hidden. So that complexity was made invisible. And that's the cycle of innovation. So when when we built Kylo, and I'm using the Royal We, I'm, I'm relatively new, six months to the, to the Kylo team. I'm very fortunate to have Jagrut Sharma and Greg Hart with me right up in the front row. Uh, they're two of the key developers on the team. So uh, when we get to the point of me not talking about rocket ships and we actually get into product, um, I, I certainly might call on one of them to say, hey, why, 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 why do you guys you know, field, field that question? <coughs> so for Kylo specifically, you know, why Kylo? I started with why, right? I like to ask that, that question a lot. Why did we think that there was a place where we could push some complexity down away from the user, um, find some hard things and make them easy, and find the really hard things and make them only just sort of average hard? Um, and, and, and really, we, there was sort of three, three big buckets that we, we cared about when we did this. You know, the, the first one is really around security and governance. Um, data lakes are not new by any, uh, by any means, but, but certainly, you know, a as they've evolved, some key problems keep on surfacing over and over again. And I'd, I'd be 
shocked if in, in your organizations you aren't seeing some variation of these, the, these problems. You know, uh, tough to control and manage security. Um, tough to make sure that you know where the data is coming from. Uh, I think everybody's heard the anecdote because it's happened at virtually ev every uh, organization of any size where you know, the CXO, some very important executive, gets a report and then they get another report and they get three reports on the same topic with three different sets of numbers. That's, you know, sort of BI at its best, right? Which means that, that somebody is not thinking about where is this data coming from, how is it governed, you know, how are we getting to, you know, things that, that, that you and I know to be fundamental of, you know, is there, you know, some single source of truth that makes sense to answer business questions. So that was, <coughs> pardon me, uh, one of the areas that we look like, uh, looked at and certainly in you know, regulated industries that comes to the forefront. You get to, you get a, to go to jail if you don't get that right. So you want to solve that. Um, I talked a lot about complexity. That's a core uh, problem. The, the tools in the, the Hadoop ecosystem, in the, the data and analytics ecosystem, the modern set of tools, they give you a lot of uh, functionality, but they can be somewhat inflexible. It can be hard to, to wire them together and you know, do what you really want to do, which I hope is um, not just do plumbing. You ultimately are not paid for the plumbing. You're paid for the value that comes on top of the plumbing. And, and so you know, part of our, uh, our goal was to make sure that, you know, things like managing the ingest and the transformation of the data, which is sort of the key thing that, that, that Kylo really does, was, uh, was easy enough for the casual user, but powerful enough for the, for the, uh, uh, for the, the IT user. And, and fundamentally, you know, getting automated processes in place and making sure that you can, you can actually, you know, build something once and automate it is a key thing. Uh, having uh, built uh, by hand, you know, the XML for many Uzi workflows. Um, you know, I can say that, you know, it's sort of like dentistry without anesthesia, right? It really, you know, it sort of works and your teeth feel better afterwards and, you know, your workflow is okay, but it's hard. Um, and so there's an example and, you know, nothing against the tool. I think, you know, it's, it's a fine tool. Um, there's an example where some complexity should be should be pushed down and, and getting out of the way. And, and all of this adds up to, you know, how did we see our customers getting business value? And the answer was it was really hard for them to get value. And, and this brings us into, you know, the, the real purpose of, of uh, Kylo and the, the, the sort of key tools underneath it, namely NiFi and, and Spark, which is, you know, we want people to be able to create both in an ad hoc fashion and an automated fashion, you know, what I call analytics ready data sense. You know, think of you know, what an analyst or what a data scientist does, and, and to a great extent what a data engineer does, and you want those three people to be working together seamlessly so that they can create um, reusable data sets that ultimately are just below in the stack to what you really want, which is actual valuable analytic endpoints. Okay, that's the end game in all of this. It's not just um, getting the infrastructure right, it's getting the infrastructure right so that I can enable um, business ready uh, data sets and therefore good solid analytics. So what is Kylo? I mean at some level it is managing the platform. Okay, it's really designed to manage the, 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 the data lake and the enterprise uh, architecture from the, the perspective of um, we manage ingest, we manage data transformation, we do it in a secure fashion while data is flowing through um, all of the uh, governance and, and provenance data through NiFi is, is being captured. And, and all of this is done in a, in a couple of ways. There's a nice UI interface, which you'll see a little later uh, when we get into the demo. Uh, and all the, the data, metadata about governance, lineage, provenance, status of feeds, et cetera, is captured under the, under the covers. Uh, I always like to draw the, con the, the distinction between what it is and what it is not. Uh, we don't consider it uh, although it does overlap to a great extent with a traditional ETL tool, it is, uh, you know, sort of complementary to a lot of those tools. We like to say that uh, if you need to build a, a dim fact or a star schema, you know, could you do it in Kylo? Yes, you could, you could sort of, you know, force it to, to do that. But there are certainly other tools that are um, really designed to, to solve that problem. It's really squarely in the space of uh, allowing uh, IT to come up with an encapsulation through NiFi of the, the core patterns of data movement and data integration that are important for the enterprise, and then to sort of elevate those through uh, the notion of a Kylo template and ultimately through a Kylo feed um, to be able to hide some of the complexity 
of, of NiFi and uh, allow those, uh, those uh, less technical users to get the value fr from the platform. And, and that was really the, the sort of core design principles behind uh, the tool. I also to mentioned, since I mentioned governance quite a bit, that I don't consider it a replacement in any meaningful way for uh, you know, uh, master data management or, or governance tools. We take an integration approach to that. So uh, all of the lineage and provenance data that we're capturing via NiFi and storing in our Metastore, that's all available through our APIs to integrate with uh, with enterprise catalogs, Alation, Waterline, Calibra, Apache uh, Atlas, the tools of tools of that nature. A um, couple of key concepts, and, and we'll get uh, quickly into the sort of meat of it in the demo. Um, I, I think most of you are here because you saw the word uh, NIFI and you're interested in, you know, what is this Kylo thing that, that Teradata's come up with? Uh, so certainly the concept of a processor, you know, sort of a purpose-built software engine that has sort of well-defined inputs and outputs is is key. Um, as I studied it and sort of looked back on, on my career in, in data, you know, one of the things I liked very much about, you know, NIFI when I first learned about it was their, their emphasis on, you know, the so-called enterprise integration patterns. This is a, it's a good body of work. If you haven't actually studied it, it's worth spending some time, you know, on Google and, and you know, seeing what those folks came, came up with because it's, it's really interesting how they take uh, the approach they take. Um, the, the, the template is really the next step up. So the NIFI flow, you connect the process to, uh, together as you know. Um, the, the template is really that next level of abstraction. It's more purpose built, it's parameterized, um, it's, it's reusable and it captures that pattern. And then we elevate it to, uh, to one level up in, uh, in Kylo, uh, we create the concept of, of a feed. And you can think of a feed as you know, starting with a template and then being able to be used over and over again, not just running the same feed over and over again on maybe you know yesterday's version of the same data, but um, that pattern is now encapsulated in Kylo so that if I need to do data ingest from a flat file and I need to apply rules to it and I need to dump it into uh, a hive table, that pattern is available. The specific flat file and the specific uh, endpoint in Hive is, is a variable in that feed, uh, but it's all driven by a UI so that a casual user can actually touch that and be successful. And, and think about, again, you know, the business analyst or the data scientist who gets their hands on uh, you know, a new piece of, uh, of data. Somebody hands them a 10,000 or 10 million row uh, file. It seems to have customer ID. It came from one of their partners. And they say, oh, that, that looks interesting. I, you know, I kind of want to join this with stuff that I know I have laying around in my enterprise data warehouse or, or in Hadoop. You know, how do I solve that, that problem? And right now, the answer is it, it can be quite hard in a lot of organizations. The, the goal of Kylo was to say, you know, we're going to give you a, a, an encapsulated pattern in the form of a feed for you to, you know, point Kylo to your file, pull it in, have it determine what the schema is, and then um, allow you to bring it into our Wrangler, transform it, uh, join it, do it, do anything that you, uh, you want with it. Um, on the tech side, I mentioned already, uh, obvi obviously, uh, it's, uh, you know, NiFi is a, a key component to all of this. All of the orchestration is happening through NiFi. Um, all of the uh, heavy lifting as far as provenance data, the, the, the core workflow, if you like, is happening through NiFi. Um, the true heavy lifting of the data is happening via Spark. Um, we don't, uh, if you can avoid it, depending on how you build a, a template, you typically don't want your data to have to flow just through the edge node. Uh, you want to take advantage of you know, distributed processing power a la Spark. So under the covers in uh, Kylo, what we're doing in, in, in most cases for well-built templates is we're actually crafting a Spark job. It's a, we're building a Scala script um, and, and we're executing it. And that's being executed through the NiFi Spark processor. Um, so under the covers, if you to look behind some of our templates, you'd actually find the Spark processor is a, is a sort of uh, important citizen in our uh, universe. And then a couple other things that we use for being able to search metadata. And of course, it's, it's ultimately a, a Java-based uh, Java application. Uh, Spring, Swagger, some common technologies are used in there to <coughs> you know, build a, a solid UI app. A Swagger, of course, for, for the APIs. Uh, and, and it is, of course, API first. Everything that you're going to see in the UI is, uh, is available first and foremost in, in the APIs. Um, and it's an extensible 
tool. It's, a, it, it's architected so that things like validation and uh, standardizers to <coughs> make sure that uh, data is conforming to enterprise rules that we as a software vendor could never possibly predict um, is available. So one could actually either on your own or through, uh, you know, through a third party you know, a, a software services group build a validator to solve your particular uh, problems. Uh, everybody gets to have one of these slides in their deck, so here's mine. Uh, this is my end-to-end -end, uh, uh, deck. We've actually talked about all of this uh, already. Uh, we've just talked about the fact that it, it handles ingest, it handles transform. Uh, these are reusable. Governance data is pulled out. Users can put their own tags on data if they want. Um, the, the, the template encapsulates all of the key uh, transformation rules that you want. Um, we do have a nice UI to help users, uh, again, those casual users, discover existing data and join it up and, and uh, work with it inside of our uh, Wrangler to create, you know, again, a new data set. So the whole goal is, you know, let's help the value chain of the data by, uh, by using this tool. Um, I'm going to quickly go through these slides. I just wanted to sort of remind people of the kind of personas I've been talking about. I talked a lot already about the analysts and the scientists, but certainly the governance aspect, you know, data stewards care about the fact that it can be automated and, and monitored uh, operations people uh, care about. Um, another view of the stack, I've really talked about most of this already. I do want to sort of spend some time on the bottom just to mention that uh, the deployment model is quite flexible. Uh, you know, Kylo, like many tools, sort of grew up with us thinking about um, it's going to be deployed on a physical edge node in a data center. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, you can't do anything without thinking about, you know, how does one uh, behave in the cloud? So of course, we have, uh, you know, any number of, of of customers, both uh, paying support customers and customers for whom we've done consulting, that uh, that use uh, Kylo in a in a cloud uh, environment. And I'm not going to talk about that. I'll leave that up for a moment, just to remind you of the kind of broad uh, cases that 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 we cover. And then we're, the fun is going to begin. We're going to go right into the the, the 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 demo. I'm going to pause there and see if there are any uh, any uh, questions or comments. Yes, in the back. Can you stand up <laughs> and, and say loudly? So uh, again, you know, we didn't really want to be a, a, a metadata you know, tool per se. Uh, our, our design goal was a, around, you know, uh, I'll, I'll back up. You know, when you build a piece of software, you sort of have to decide you know, how big is the circle that you want to encompass. And, and uh, our philosophy was, uh, we did not necessarily want to be in the um, in the, the 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 governance business per se or the catalog business per se. Uh, to that point, uh, I, th I think I mentioned uh, Atlas as one of the tools that that we integrate with. So we're capturing the metadata um, in and storing it in our repository. We by no means consider our repository to be you know your enterprise grade uh, catalog. Our approach is we want. You know, the enterprise to choose whatever tool suits them best, and it could certainly be uh, Atlas, or it could be, again, the commercial tools, Waterline, Calibra, and just use our metadata API to, to integrate. So thank you. Yes, and stand up and speak loudly, or you can use the microphone, apparently there's... All right. Yeah, so I'm going to answer the first part, then I'm going to ask Greg or, or uh, Jagrut to, to answer the, the second part. Uh, we, we certainly have our own uh, API, so we, we built our own metadata API, uh, metadata API because you know, we, we sort of control and own the, the schema and how that data lands in the, in the MySQL or the Postgres uh, database, and that's our integration point. The, to the second point, I'll, I'll, I'll ask uh, one of my uh, engineers to get up to the microphone so everybody can hear you, or, or, or not. <laughs> you can yell it out. And then Greg will tell us about that. Is it on? Alice, um, you would just use uh, whatever your existing uh, part is. So if you are using NiFi already to integrate into Atlas, you can just keep on doing that. Um, you can hook uh, NiFi. Or we hook into NiFi's Providence repository to get some additional metadata and uh, better performance. Uh, so you could um, uh, hook into our stuff and integrate with Atlas if, it's Atl if you're not getting enough information from NiFi already. 
So there's a couple options. All right, thank you, Greg. Uh, another question. Yeah, so that, that comes up a lot, uh, and I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. One, I'll, I'll sort of go to the second part first, is you know, anyone who has access to the tool. I should mention, and, and, and we'll see it in a moment, that, uh, of course, we have an access uh, model and a security model. It's uh, typically driven, as many are, by, uh, you know, you log in in the morning, and you're, you know, authenticated through AD and or LDAP, and you're in a group, and, and we certainly respect those groups, and, and that controls what you can see. So the the you know anybody can do anything to the extent that you are allowed to have access to the data source and it might be that you're you're not allowed to have access to certain uh, data sources so it's controlled in that sense and so what feeds you have access to again the feed being sort of our abstraction uh, on top of of, of NiFi um, is is part of that as well we we don't right now have an uh, an approval process per se um, but we've had uh, customers through consulting who have taken advantage of the fact that, um, you know, feeds can be kicked off like, like everything in, in Kylo programmatically. Um, so that it, it's certainly possible to integrate uh, Kylo via our, our APIs into, you know, sort of enterprise workflow and, and, and approval systems. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing. We've talked about it a, a lot as to, you know, again, uh, to the question before about why didn't we use Atlas? You know, what's the what, what are the boundaries within which you want to uh, to operate? And we sort of felt that you know enterprise approval processes are so so varied and use so many different tools. You know, down to very homegrown tools that the most important thing that we could say is that with appropriate permissions, one could make a call to an API and and kick off a feed, and you can put guardrails around the feeds depending on how you would design it and what permissions you you put on that feed to control. I would say sort of some, but not all of what you're, you're, you're talking about. All right, now, now the moment of the truth. This is what everyone uh, is waiting for, which is uh, a very foolish person attempting to do a live demo during a talk. So one more question before I completely make a fool of myself. No, my, my connection seems good, so I think it's going to be fine. Is anybody with Ambari, or do you need to go to a package manager? No, it's, yeah, we, uh, we support Ambari. Okay. So. Okay, no, good, thank you. Uh, I was going to avoid the, the businessy stuff, but, uh, but, but you asked for it. So, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it is a proper open source uh, tool, so you can free to use it. You can download it. The, the bits that you download right now, if you go to, uh, to kylo.io, which is our, our website, uh, the 091 version we just put out there uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, as the guys know, you know, we're, we're on Scrum every day talking about, you know, are we at 091 yet? Are we good? Have we, have we cleared testing? Um, so we have a formal process for doing that. About once a quarter, we put one of those out. Um, and we have, you know, plenty of folks just downloading it and kicking the tires and going on community and, and asking us questions. Of course, you know, we're, we're business. We'd very much like uh, for some of them to, to come over and, um, have a commercial relationship with us, uh, which is the second part of the answer to your question, which is we have a support model. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want support for Kylo from uh, the folks that uh, do the, the bulk of the committing, uh, that would be us, and, and we're sort of happy to, to do business. But yeah, people can, people can use it. We put it out there uh, freely, and at this point, we don't have any uh, proprietary uh, holdbacks. Uh, I'm, I'm saying at this point deliberately because I'm, you know, part of my role is as the business manager of this this product to think about, you know, how do we better monetize it? How do we better make sure that, you know, that that you know we can sustain our little part of the Teradata business in a way that, you know, lets us to continue to invest in in Kylo. Typically an edge node, uh, I mean, you can, you can run on more than one, but so you can, uh, you go to, why don't you go to the microphone to group, <laughs> make sure everybody can hear you. Yeah, so you can, um, it supports clustered NiFi, and also you can have multiple instances of Kylo, and they can also, it, it depends on the deployment model, like for example, if you have clustered NiFi, then you put Kylo, and then you put a load balancer, and then it can load balance the nodes. But you, it also supports, um, yeah, you can deploy Kylo itself in a clustered mode 
it will work. You just have to make sure that your flows, the, the flows that you define are defined correctly because NIFI by itself is masterless. So um, it, all the nodes actually process all the data. So you just have to um, make sure that your NIFI flows support the model that you um, are trying to deploy. For example, if you have a flow that does not work properly if all the nodes pick up the data, then you don't need to make sure that once one node in NIFI picks up the data, it's not available for processing to the other nodes. So it's a little bit of architecture, but short answer is yes. Thank you. No, the, thanks, thanks to Groot. And, you know, it, it goes back to one of the other principles that, that I mentioned before of, you know, if you're, if you're designing your, your templates uh, in general, you don't want uh, data to be flowing through the edge, edge node. So the, the footprint, if you like, of Kylo is, is, is quite small. Um, the, you know, the, the data that it creates is fundamentally the feed data. The data that it captures uh, as feeds are, are executing uh, is 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 you know relatively small, so it's designed to be small footprint again, and to offload the heavy lifting uh, to NiFi, and again uh, for, for the most part over to uh, to Spark. So my mouse is working, my uh, my, my demo is live. So this is Kylo. Um, I, I like to start at the dashboard level and then sort of work my day, my way down into you know, what people see. Uh, again, uh, everything that you see here is built on top of our API. So in terms of sort of monitoring all of your feeds, you know, you've you've bought into the story that you need to reduce complexity. You want to create feeds um, on top of those core uh, NiFi patterns that you've created, um, and. You know, how do you manage that? Well, uh, certainly you can hire somebody to stare at this pane of glass. This is more of an opportunistic management, right? You go in, if you're the manager, you're going to take a look and you're going to try to figure out, you know, do I have any unhealthy services? How are my feeds doing? Uh, are there any jobs running? Um, to the API point, uh, of course, uh, you have enterprise monitoring systems. Your IT uh, shop is in invested in making sure that uh, all of the tools that have been purchased and are part of your, your ecosystem are being managed in a consistent way. So you can always hook into our APIs um, to, uh, to you know, have that management data consumed by, by an enterprise tool. But this is our sort of single pane of glass that gives you uh, all of the information uh, about uh, Kylo. Um, I'm just going to sort of pick the first one on the list. I haven't picked this one in a while, so I don't know what's going on there. Um, uh, the answer is not much. Um, so we'll find one that's got a good amount of data on it. There we go. And just to give you a little bit of, uh, a little bit of flavor for uh, what we have, a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of, uh, all right, uh, no, no big deal. Uh, we'll just create a new one. How about that? Um, so the basic idea there is that, you know, no matter what's going on in the, in the feed, you know, all of the history of the feed is, is going on. If you guys can remember one that's probably live that has a lot of data, just let me know and I'll, I'll, go, over, uh, I'll, I'll go over to it. Um, so we have uh, any number of feeds uh, uh, available here. So here's one. Uh, my middle initial is D, so that must be one that, that I created. Um, I just want to give you a sense of you know what sort of data is uh, uh, available for it. Um, you know we may have lineage data for it, so I like to start uh, here. I in this particular case, um, there's a particular directory which is the the the, the source node for for this particular uh, feed, and I think I can uh, expand this a little bit more with uh, my mouse to make it a little bit. Uh, more palatable. There you go. Um, so I have a directory called var drop zone. Uh, that's not in important what the name is. I had a feed that I created and I s had a parameter available in that feed to say um, where should I pick up files for. So it's a very common pattern, right? There's any number of processes, right, that uh, for better or worse are just generating files and you need to take them, you need to ingest them in some meaningful way. And the interesting thing about th this particular um, you know, diagram is, is that it's, it's capturing in a visual sense, and I promise behind the scenes it's capturing sort of metadata on this, that someone has created uh, two independent feeds, both starting from that, that same data. So already you're getting a sense that, that visually you can see what the, uh, what's going on with this data. There, there's lineage. For some reason this data is going into, into two different sets of, of tables. 
that's perfectly fine if you think about it. Um, and it's good that we capture it. And it's good that if you're a data steward or, or a governance person to know um, this particular source data is used in the following way throughout our organization. And as it progresses, these are clearly very simple uh, feeds here. They're just taking some data, applying some rules, and, and dumping it into a hive table. Um, but as that data moves through the organization, we're capturing all of that, uh, all of that data and allowing you, know, you to, again, integrate it with, uh, with other tools. So I just wanted to, to show you that uh, uh, quickly to, get, uh, to give you a sense of um, you know, some of the, the, the data that we capture along with the, uh, with the feed. Um, I'm just going to walk you through creation of, of a feed, uh, and I'm going to click on the more button here just to show you sort of more templates. Uh, <clears throat> I'll step outside the speaker and say, you know, one of the things that uh, sort of I, I recognized, all these, these templates are ones that we sort of create out of the box. Um, we don't actually install them at install time for Kylo. They're sitting out in, in, in GitHub, and when I sort of first installed the tool and, you know, read the doc and said, you know, oh, there's all these other sort of cool templates. I think I'll install them in, in my instance. I, I think it took me about four minutes after that to write a ticket for the guys and say, can we please just, you know, make these easily available right away? I mean, there's so many, I mean, just look at the titles of, 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 of some of these. There's some interesting starting points, if you like, um, for, uh, for different, different sorts of feeds. So, so the, the basic idea is, is that, you know, these are those patterns encapsulated inside of of, of Kylo templates. There's really no limit, you know, to what you can do. You know, think of, think of the NiFi palette, right? All right, I'm seeing a sign that says 10 minutes. I think we're actually in very good shape. We'll be able to do 10, and then we'll have a, a few minutes uh, for questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to pick one. I'm going to pick advanced, uh, and I'm going to call it um, data summit test because I'm extremely creative. And that's, uh, that's where we're at. Uh, I'm going to give it a category. Uh, so all feeds have to have, uh, ha have a category. And those are, you know, user-defined. You define whatever categories you want. Um, this particular template is called an advanced template. If we were to look behind the scenes at the, uh, the underlying uh, NiFi template, you can imagine that since there are any number of sources uh, available for this one, the NiFi template looks like sort of a, a big column of sources, all with arrows going into a, a, single, a single processor. And that's sort of how, how you should visualize a lot of these. But you know, I'll just sort of keep, li keep life simple. Uh, I'll do a uh, file system. Uh, I'll sort of do the same thing that I did uh, in, in the other ones that you saw, only because it's a familiar pattern. Uh, so I have a file area. Uh, it's going to match a, a particular p file pattern. To my earlier point of reducing complexity, uh, probably virtually everyone in this room, you know, sort of gets that little sort of, you know, uh, regex pattern. Um, we want to make it even simpler than that, right? There's, there's a casual user, a data scientist, or a business analyst who should probably not have to think about that. So, you know, an example of a small thing that, you know, in the next release, you're almost certainly going to see we're going to sort of simplify how uh, one can think about, you know, file names and, 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 and patterns and the like. Um, I'm going to take the approach of uh, assuming I have a CSV file and then using uh, uh, sample data. So I'm just going to grab uh, a piece of sample data and I'm going to upload it to, to Kylo. And this is the actual process that, that an, uh, a casual user would, would go through. They would do exactly what I did here. Um, immediately, you can see sort of two things. In the background, you can see that, um, that Kylo has in, inferred the schema. It wasn't hard in this case. It was a CSV file that happened to have a, a, a header record on it. If it had not seen a header record, it would have also done its best to infer the schema, and it would have uh, you know, sort of invented some, some sort of simple column names for it, which you would, of course, uh, override. But I, I want to draw your attention to, um, to, to, to the modal dialog that, that's popped up here. It has determined by its scan of the sample data that there appear to be what we call domain types. And this is a Kylo-specific concept that, that, we, uh, that, that we built. And you can think of a domain type, uh, sort of my highly technical description, as sort of a bucket of rules, right? It, it is a set of rules uh, around which one can um, can you know govern particular data types? So it believes it's found something that looks like an ISO 860, uh, 8601 uh, timestamp, and it thinks it's found 
uh, a birth date. And there's a, a number of domain types that are available sort of out of the box, as a credit card, uh, social security number. There's, there's a, a, a bunch of them that are, are common email addresses, another one. And, and of course, because Kylo is extensible, you can build your own, uh, your, your own domain types and add them to, to, to your Kylo. Um, so uh, I'm going to apply them because I, I, I look at this and I say, okay, I, I, I believe that those are uh, very reasonable uh, types. Uh, so Kylo has found all of these uh, items. Uh, typical target is going to be something like Hive, although that's by no means uh, exclusive. You know, we call it data lake management. The, the data lake concept is much broader than, than obviously just, uh, just, just Hive the, these days or, or HDFS. Um, and, and of course, you know that there's sort of no real primary key support there, but I could decide that, hey, I know a little bit about this data. ID is, in fact, a key. It's one of those primary keys that's used all over the, the, the company, so I might decide that I want to use that. Uh, and, and that helps us with, uh, with other things. I can uh, do advanced things like uh, do partitions. So if I wanted to, I could say, you know, I want to partition on month. Um, and that's right on the edge. You know, a, a business analyst might not get the idea of partitions, but a data scientist might very much be thinking about, <coughs> pardon me, um, about, you know, month is important and my data architect told me that if we ingest data and we uh, coordinate it off by month, it makes certain queries faster. And, and so that's something that you would want to present to them. Pardon me. Uh, so I, I won't do that right now. I'm just going to go on to the next step because I want to give you a chance to see it. Um, I have the option of, of profiling. So this is sort of capturing basic, uh, basic statistics on the data. And those are going to vary depending on the data type. So for numeric, uh, it might be capturing, uh, you know, sort of standard you know, quartiles and ranges. Uh, for a string type, it might be capturing, you know, uh, what are all of the unique uh, values and what is their, their frequency. So the kind of data that you would care about uh, to use later on, again, if you're a data scientist or if those statistics were meaningful uh, operationally in your shop, you could extract them uh, from, from Kylo and use them to inform uh, other processes that, that care about this data. Uh, you can add uh, validators. So we can take a look at the the current validators that, that are there. This one has to be, happens to be around email address. But I could do, you know, any number of other uh, validators or standardizations that I want. Uh, we have a set of rules incorporated in them. So, you know, I could, I could trim them if I want. And like everything else, I'll just cancel out of this. In uh, Kylo, we have, a, uh, again, an extensible architecture. You can build your own. So imagine you have very complex validation uh, rules driven by, you know, a, a set of relational tables and a lot of your data gets filtered uh, through that. We actually have a, a customer whose name I, I can't uh, mention, of course, who is doing exactly that. They had a process that did validation based on, you know, essentially lookup uh, of, of data. So we're, we're building a custom validator plugin uh, f for them that uh, pulls those tables in, uh, makes the important uh, performance uh, uh, decision that they're probably not going to change a lot from run to run, so we cast them and and uh, pull them in in that way. Uh, the business unit. This is just a way of tagging m metadata. Um, I can add any metadata that I I want here. It becomes searchable. It gets stored in our our meta store. It gets associated with this. So this is a way of um, you know making sure that the business users who hopefully ha have been uh, trained and are working hand in hand with their governance people are recognizing that you know data sets you know can and should be you know, be, be named and have meaningful uh, tags and data from them. Um, I mentioned uh, before that we have a, a permission model so at this point in the in the feed I can actually set up my access controls uh, and determine you know which uh, which uh, groups can uh, can can use it. So uh, I won't do any of that right now. And then ultimately, uh, I can schedule it. Uh, most feeds uh, are scheduled on a, on a timer. Uh, you do have an option. There's another uh, sort of piece of complexity that I want to change. You can actually uh, put a cron string in there. And since there uh, you know, aren't a lot of people on the planet who spend time you know, sort of memorizing the vagaries of, of cron, uh, you know, eventually we're going to put sort of a normal calendar uh, calendar in interface there. Uh, and then I can just sort of enable the, the feed. It'll take a few seconds because uh, I'm uh, 
running on an unknown network here. Um, all it's doing is saving all of my choices through, through that, the name of the, the file drop. Uh, you notice that there was a very small number of parameters, a small number of knobs that I could turn um, <coughs> to make this uh, happen. And if I want, I can, uh, again, look at the, the details of this feed and sort of everything that I did has been captured there. And to the extent possible, um, I can go back and do uh, do editing uh, of this, and of course this this job hasn't uh, hasn't run. So I'm going to go back to the dashboard um, and see if I can pick uh, pick some running jobs or some jobs that have run uh, recently. Uh, here's a good example of something that ran a, a little while ago. Um, at, at the at the lowest level, what is happening? You know, jobs are consisting of steps. Those approximately map to um, the the node connections that you made when you built out your 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 NiFi template, with some exceptions. Of course, we're as I mentioned, we're building our own job that executes this, and there's a granularity of of step that that we control. Um, as well, but you can you can look at, at any level of detail. Uh, if a job has failed, you can get that failure information um, emitted to somebody via email, or again, you can hook into our APIs. Uh, hey, I'm seeing the time up uh, uh, slot. I, I didn't want to get uh, to the to the, uh, the the data wrangler if I could very uh, briefly. Um, so he is going to try to kick me out. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to not let him. Um, just to show you very quickly um, <coughs> the kinds of things you can do in our Wrangler. Again, from from a data scientist pr perspective, I'm just gonna select the table just to to do something uh, uh, quickly and to sort of show you the kinds of things that are available. Um, you recognize here in the drop down, the sort of our function bar uh, that you can do you know any number of functions. These are fundamentally from Spark. Uh, so the, the metaphor here behind the scenes, the tool is a Spark data frame. And this is a, it's a live Spark shell that, that, that's going on that's pulled in a sample of this data and is manipulating it. Um, at the column level, I can do anything I want. I can do any number of transformations. I can do one-hot encoding. I can replace empty strings. I can impute missing values. Um, so all of the powerful tools you, you expect in a... Uh, in a Wrangler are there. I can apply those domain types that I mentioned. Um, I have the option at the function level to do um, you know, common aggregation. So if I choose that, it will pick up um, you know, the, the, the framework, if you like, or the skeleton of the, the, the Spark function. Um, and I can fill that in and, and quickly do, um, do aggregation uh, based, based on that. So I can do actor ID and for a count of film ID, for example. And I can add that column and immediately for each actor it counts the number of films that this shows. It's just a very simple example of the kinds of things and all of this gets saved. You know, the idea is that you save it and you've created a transformation feed. So you can imagine a data scientist or an analyst starting with a new data set controlled by the pattern that you as a, a person in IT has, has given them, um, um, ingesting that data, uh, performing a new transform and ultimately creating a new data set um, that, that lands in a location that's now available for, um, for advanced analytics. And all of this without them having to to write any meaningful amount of, of code, all of it sitting inside of one tool, and all of it sitting on top of, again, powerful platform of, of Spark and NiFi. That's all I got. Uh, they're going to kick me out. Again, uh, my name is Matt Lodato. Thank you very much to, uh, to, to Greg and uh, Jagroot for, uh, for helping out. And if you need to talk to me, that's how you do it. Thank you so much.